militaries and other armed forces have some of the best logistics, investigations, and equipment in the world. But even they aren't immune to mysteries. It was the height of World War I when a converted sailing barge traveling from England to France with a shipment of coal was found run aground and abandoned. The ship, a schooner named Zabrina, had been built in the late 1800s for river transportation. But when war broke out in Europe, it was one of many vessels acquired to help in the war effort. Zabrina was set to work as a cargo vessel, primarily shipping coal from Britain to France. It was a simple trip, one the vessel and its crew had completed many times before. And nobody suspected anything would be any different when it left Swansea in October of 1917. Two days after it left port, French authorities found it run aground near Cherbourg. Like all good ghost ship stories, the five-man crew was not aboard, though all their personal belongings and logbooks were found. According to reports, the ship was found with a table set for a meal, which had been in the process of being prepared when the crew disappeared. Even the galley fire was still burning, indicating the crew hadn't been gone for long. There was no sign of damage on the vessel other than what it sustained when it ran aground. It would be easy to assume the ship was caught by German U-boats. It had happened to countless similar vessels during the war. The theory goes that the Sabrina crew had been captured by an enemy U-boat, but before torpedoes could be launched at the Sabrina, a British ship attacked and sunk the sub, not knowing its own men were aboard. If this was the case though, no ship ever reported such an attack. Also, the Germans were under strict instructions to collect logbooks and documentation from any ships they captured as evidence of their activities. If Germans had time to round up all the crew and force them onto the sub, it doesn't make sense for them to leave that valuable documentation behind. The other theory is that the Zabrina crew thought they saw a U-book and spooked fled the ship. If this was the case, they decided against taking the lone lifeboat that was on board, which French authorities found when the ship was recovered. Many different cultures around the world have their own version of the mythical Bigfoot, but it's not often any of these mysterious ape-like creatures have been reported by the military. Even less common, is for reports to be as numerous as those about the rock apes in Vietnam. The Vietnam War is already a disturbing part of human history, without the help of supernatural entities. With the Viet Cong having mastered guerrilla tactics, it could often seem like the enemy was completely invisible to the US and their allies and the fact the US played haunting audio recordings of fake ghosts didn't make the hostile jungle any more settling. But during the war, both sides claimed to have seen something that wasn't human in the jungle. The creatures could be about six feet tall. They were strongly built with long limbs and brown or orange hair. They lived in troops in the most remote areas of the jungle and appeared to have no fear of humans. In fact, they could be aggressive and would throw rocks at soldiers. These were known as the Batatut or the jungle people, and locals claimed they'd lived in the jungle for years. They were allegedly seen throughout Southeast Asia, but with the Vietnam War encroaching on their supposed territory, sightings became more and more frequent. American soldiers nicknamed them the Rock Apes, and comparisons were made to the Bigfoot that was a popular legend in the US at the time. But these creatures appeared to be much more social. Without any knowledge of the Vietnamese fauna, it would be easy to assume these were misidentified orangutans. Their hairless faces with big mouths and protruding stomachs are definitely similar to the big apes, 
but orangutans had been extinct in Vietnam for thousands of years. It's possible this was a remote group who'd survived undetected by scientists for so long, but this seems unlikely. Other primates in the area are not known to grow to the size of the Batatut, though some smaller sightings are believed to have been misidentified gibbons. During the war, a number of search parties were sent out to try to capture one of the creatures, alive or otherwise. However, no physical evidence was ever recovered. Some have used this as proof that the creatures were a figment of the imaginations of the tired and scared soldiers. With so much fighting happening in the jungle, it's remarkable none of the search teams found a specimen that had been caught in the crossfire. But as the apes are supposedly social creatures, it could be argued they might recover the bodies of fallen members of their troop. To this day, what exactly the soldiers saw if anything at all, remains unknown. On February 19, 1945, the U-530 submarine left Kiel in Germany. The commander was a young man named Otto Wermuth, only 24 years old and on his first ever mission in command. Five months later, the submarine emerged in Argentina and surrendered to the military there. The time it took the sub to take the trip has been the subject of countless conspiracies and what really happened remained a mystery. Germany had surrendered to the Allied forces two months before the sub emerged in Argentina. At the time, a message had been sent out to all submarines still on patrol to surrender to the nearest United Nations port and only travel to the surface. It wasn't a command Otto Wermuth had followed. Wermuth would later tell investigators he believed the message to be a trick by the enemy, but erred on the safe side and ended any combat. The submarine had been patrolling the US and Canadian East Coast at the time, and Wermuth decided to travel to Argentina rather than surrender in the United States, as he figured they would get a slightly warmer welcome in a country he believed was still neutral. Along the way, the submarine dumped all its ammunitions, including the deck guns, as well as radar equipment, and strangely, all logbooks and other secret documents. Even ID badges worn by the staff had been discarded. When asked how he could even prove he was the commander of the submarine, the only thing where Muth had been able to come up with was that he had a signed marriage document for one of his men who'd been married by proxy over the radio during their voyage. The complete lack of any documentation has led to many questions about what exactly the crew was trying to hide. There were 54 men aboard and Wermuth told investigators he hadn't taken any passengers. He added nobody had left the sub since it left Germany all those months ago. However, local press at the time reported a man who appeared to be wearing a high-ranking military clothing outfit and a civilian woman who were seen exiting the submarine. They also reported fire damage, which didn't appear to be accounted for. Officials who interrogated Wermuth didn't believe that he thought the call to surrender was false and called him out on a few other lies. He would not give details about the path the submarine had taken and he later said he looked forward to living in Argentina and wanted to bring his family over once everything blew over. He and his crew and the submarine were turned over to the US. It's more than likely Wermuth hadn't been secretly smuggling the leaders of the German regime, but the complete destruction of the logbooks and other documentation has left questions that will probably never be satisfactorily answered. On January 26, 1950, a U.S. Air Force plane left Anchorage, Alaska with 44 people on board, and it was never seen again. The mysterious disappearance of the C-54 is one of the biggest disappearances of U.S. military personnel. 42 servicemen, including 8 crew members, and 2 civilians vanished that day. What happened to the plane as it flew over the Yukon is a question families of the victims are still asking the government to answer. 
but no progress in the investigation has been made since 1950. Even before the plane left the ground in Anchorage, there were issues. The original departure time had been sometime in the morning, but the takeoff had to be abandoned due to a problem with the engines. They were able to get it fixed the same day, but it was much later by the time the C-54 got into the air. From that point on though, nobody reported any issues. The plane was on a well-established route following the Alaska highways southeast. The route had regular emergency strips in case of emergency landings that may be needed, and special radio stations to make sure the pilots could keep in touch with ground control. At 3.09 p.m., two hours after the plane left Alaska, the pilot made a routine report to say they were flying over the town of Snag in Yukon. It expected to reach the next destination in 30 minutes, but it didn't make another report. When the plane failed to arrive at its scheduled destination in Montana, US and Canadian armed forces sent out search parties. It was one of the biggest searches in the history of the area. There had been planned war exercises nearby, so 7,000 soldiers were on hand to search for any sign of a wreckage. Recovery teams would trek through the mountains, acting on tips made by members of the public about smoke or explosions. They sent 10 military planes flying 20 miles apart along the route the C-54 was supposed to have taken, hoping to pick up on any radio messages calling for help, but there was nothing. The area in question consists of two steep mountains and the highway running between them, and some locals reported seeing a plane flying very low around where the missing plane would have been, but there were no signs of a crash. The army actually lost more planes in the search, though everyone on board survived and the search was called off after a few weeks. It hasn't stopped unofficial searches from taking place. The area is still frequented by trappers, indigenous people, geologists, and miners, but none have come across the wreckage. It's possible, though unlikely, the plane deviated off course for some reason and was lost over the Pacific Ocean. Alternate theories suggest the plane tried to land on what would turn out to be a frozen lake and disappeared beneath the waters when the ice cracked, though there are no lakes deep enough to submerge the entire plane in the area. The full extent of the secrets held by the United States during the height of the Cold War is unlikely to ever be known. Many of the mysteries from the 1950s, such as UFOs and unknown satellites, are believed to now be then-classified experimental technology the government was trying to develop. What happened to Lt. Paul Whipke may be one of those secrets. Paul Whipke grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He studied civil engineering at a university and earned his army pilot's wings in 1956. Not long after, he was stationed at Fort Ord in California. On July 10, 1958, he told some of the other officers he was going out for a drink in town. He would never return. When Whipke didn't return the following day, his fellow officers weren't too concerned at first. Then, less than 24 hours after he was last seen, his belongings were packed into crates ready to be shipped home. Paul's brother, Carl, happened to call the base on July 12th only to find out that his brother wasn't there. He was AWOL, apparently, but this only made Carl even more suspicious. He knew the army didn't work that quickly. It should have taken much longer to start packing up his things. Carl believed Paul had been involved in the atomic bombing tests in Nevada the year before. He'd been stationed at Camp Desert Rock, near where the tests were taking place, but the army's official stance was that he wasn't involved. However, one of the items that was mistakenly packed with Paul's personal belongings was a list of his assignments, which included five hours logged as an observation pilot during the test. According to another officer, he would relay messages to the ground team. Not long after the tests, Paul grew sick. He developed black spots and warts on his hands 
lost weight, and suffered constant colds. Carl believed his brother had been exposed to radiation, but again, this was denied by the army. In the months leading up to Paul's disappearance, he'd been interviewed by two army intelligence agents on a number of occasions. Naturally, what they discussed remains unknown, but the meetings made Paul noticeably worried and he wouldn't talk about them. The army and the FBI were able to trace some of Paul's actions after he left the base the night he disappeared. He checked into a hotel hundreds of miles away from the base. The next day, he bought 14 gallons of gas. Five weeks later, the car Paul had been driving was found abandoned in Death Valley. The keys were still in the ignition and a pile of cigarette butts were found next to it, even though Paul didn't smoke. The army claimed Paul had been under pressure because of an assignment, had driven to the desert and then passed away after he vanished. This explanation does make some sense, although there are some aspects that don't add up, such as a rancher who claims to have seen someone in military clothing driving the car four weeks after Paul disappeared. Carl kept digging, only to discover the FBI, who had been brought in to investigate after Paul was declared AWOL, had destroyed their files on the case. In 1982, the army changed its official stance to say Paul had died in the line of duty, which only helped to muddy the waters. Carl always suspected the military knew what had happened to his brother. Whether he'd left to join the CIA, had died due to secretive experiments, or was taken out by agents, he didn't know. But if the army was involved in his disappearance, getting the FBI involved to investigate also doesn't make much sense. Carl passed away in 2019, still without answers to the questions he'd been asking for decades. It's unlikely now that those answers will ever be revealed. YouTube user Ivan0135 has four videos published to his YouTube channel, the longest of which is only 1 minute and 44 seconds long. The first video was posted on the 14th of April 2011 and claims to show leaked Air Force UFO footage filmed between 1942 and 1969. In the very grainy footage, an object similar to a zeppelin is seen floating in the sky before the camera switches to an aerial view of a disc-shaped object moving through the sky. Next, we see what many believe to be an alien creature lying next to the same flying object seen before, seemingly depicting a downed alien aircraft with its passenger now incapacitated or deceased on the ground. The second video is the most talked about and is entitled Alien Gray Extraterrestrial Zeta Reticuli UFO Leaked Footage. It's known as the Skinny Bob video, which has been viewed more than 600,000 times. It claims to reveal samples of a recorded study of an extraterrestrial life form filmed in black and white, a large-headed alien being Dressed in tight clothing can be seen as the camera pans over its elongated fingers and arms, as well as its large eyes. In the third video, which only contains text, it's made clear that any conclusions drawn about the videos are the speculation of those who watch it, and that any misinformation that is created is not dependent on the owner of the video. The last video claims to be one of many diplomatic visits made by extraterrestrials where discussions were held concerning matters of mutual concern. Text on the screen explains that the meetings were held at secret locations and that only high-ranking officials met with these beings. This particular video alleges that in 1961, three of the beings were filmed upon arrival which was later forbidden by a treaty. It shows three of the same beings walking among three other men before realizing that they were being filmed. As one of the beings looks at and approaches the camera, 
The footage ends with the video claiming that the treaty was revised following this incident. The videos have never been verified or debunked, with many still believing that the footage shows actual proof of alien life. It remains a mystery, however, as Ivan0135 has not posted any other videos since May 18, 2011. Unfavorable Semicircle was a YouTube channel created on the 30th of March 2015. The channel's first video would not be uploaded until five days later, but it would trigger one of the most mysterious channels in YouTube's history. The first video lasted just four seconds and didn't have any audio, showing only a brown background image with what seems to be a black hole or spot. Similar videos would be uploaded in rapid succession, as many as one every 10 minutes, some of which seeming to contain clues to some unknown mystery. Most of the uploads featured blurry, dark tones, with dots appearing at seemingly random intervals and locations on the images. The number of uploads would increase exponentially by February, however, with a new video being added every 20 seconds or so. It was found that encoded in many of these videos is the voice of a man speaking either a single or series of letters or numbers, none of which seem to have any connection to the other. While most of the videos are only a few seconds long, one was uploaded containing mostly silence which lasted for 11 hours. The two best known uploads are titled Lock and D-Lock. Lock is 27 minutes in length and shows intense flashing colors with distorted audio. D-Lock is described as sounding like a distant, echoed scream with what appears to be a voice whispering and children singing. While there have been many theories as to what the videos actually meant, ranging from it being a game to recruit agents, to being a number station used by spies. It remains a mystery as the channel was suspended by YouTube in 2016. Max Headroom was a fictional AI character created in 1985 by George Stone, Annabelle Jenkel, and Rocky Morton. He was dubbed as the first computer-generated TV personality and became known for being quick-witted and his electronic, stuttering voice. Although the character had the appearance of being electronically created, it was actually played by actor Matt Frewer. On November 22, 1987, WGN-TV in Chicago was in the middle of a sports broadcast segment when the picture went blank for 15 seconds, followed by a person wearing a Max Headroom mask and sunglasses, swaying back and forth to the sound of an eerie buzzing noise. This lasted for approximately 28 seconds and only ended after WGN engineers were able to switch the signal frequency that linked the studio to the station's transmitter. That same evening, at 11.20 p.m., the local PBS station, WTTW, was airing an episode of Doctor Who entitled Horror of Fang Rock when the same figure appeared on screen. Wearing the same mask, the figure claims, that does it, he's a freaking nerd. That's right, I'm no better than Chuck Swirsky, freaking liberal. Referring to the radio announcer, for the Chicago Bulls basketball team. The masked figure would go on to hold up a can of Pepsi while claiming catch the wave and singing the phrase, your love is fading. They then hummed the theme song to a 1959 animated show called Clutch Cargo and spoke about sharing a pair of gloves with their brother. The video then suddenly changed, showing the figure mostly off screen with their backside exposed, yelling, oh no, they're coming to get me, while being spanked by a female holding a fly swatter. The image then slowly faded to static 
before the normal broadcast continued. Due to a lack of engineers on duty, the signal could not be traced and technicians were unable to stop the intrusive broadcast. When the footage of both the hacked broadcasts were uploaded to YouTube decades later, it sparked a renewed interest in the mystery, with many web sleuths studying the footage in a bid to uncover the masked hacker. However, even after a Max Headroom tip line was created and many leads were investigated, the prankster and his accomplices remained unidentified and no further clues have been uncovered. FPS Russia is a YouTube channel created by Kyle Myers from Georgia in 2010. In his videos, Kyle would take on the persona of Dmitry, who he described as a professional Russian. The subject matter of the channel was mostly focused around the use of weapons and explosives, with Kyle portraying his character with a heavy Russian accent. By June of 2011, FPS Russia had accrued a massive amount of subscribers and quickly became one of the most popular channels of its genre in the history of YouTube. Each of the videos sees Dimitri going through the various characteristics of each of the weapons featured, after which he would give a demonstration of the weapon's capabilities, firing at bottles, mannequins, fruit, or even photos of Justin Bieber. On the 3rd of January, 2013, a man named Keith Radcliffe from Kentucky was found deceased in his home in Georgia. He died of a single gunshot wound to the head. Keith was the co-owner of FPS Industries, which was a custom weapons fabrication and testing company. He was also a member of the FPS Russia production team, being responsible for obtaining the firearm licenses for the weapons used in the channel's videos. After his passing, FPS Russia went on hiatus and did not upload any content until February 19th of 2013. During investigation, police suggested that foul play was involved, even though no one was arrested and no charges were filed. Investigations were hampered by the fact that surveillance equipment was missing from the store. On the 29th of March, Kyle's home was raided by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives with a team of nearly 40 officers in attendance. Another team was dispatched to the area where Kyle's farm was raided, and it was a location that was often used for filming. An ATF spokesperson stated that they raided the properties due to suspicions that Kyle was manufacturing explosives for distribution sale, or use by their own business without holding a valid license. No arrests were made on that occasion either, and it's unclear whether any explosives or weapons were seized. The raids would cause the channel to fall silent for a further nine months, only uploading new content in January of 2014. But two years later, the ATF would raid Kyle's house again and he was arrested after it was found that his P.O. box contained 25 grams of butane honey oil, which is a high-grade marijuana concentrate. He would plead guilty to possession with intent to distribute. He was sentenced to two years in prison with two years probation and a fine of $7,500. That signaled the end of FPS Russia and the channel has not uploaded any videos since, though it is still technically active. As for the passing of Keith Ratcliffe, there have been no further developments and we're no closer to understanding what really happened to it. 11BX1371 is a mysterious video that went viral in 2015 thought to have been first publicized by GadgetZZ.com, a Swedish tech blog, though it was later discovered that it was first published on YouTube a few months prior. 
The video was named after the plain text of a base 64 string written on the DVD sent to Gadget ZZ is in black and white and shows a figure wearing a Plague Doctor costume while making his way through an abandoned and dilapidated building, sometimes walking and at some points merely standing still. Through some of the window openings, a forest can be seen in the background, and the visuals are accompanied by loud buzzing noises. The dark figure is seen holding up its hand, in which there is a light that blinks at irregular intervals. Upon closely scrutinizing the footage, it was found that hidden in the video and its spectrogram, it contained messages that are often used in ciphers and encryption systems. It also contained hidden visuals of various people in many states of torture. Many of the messages have been deciphered by Reddit users, with the images being attributed to visuals from prominent murder investigations, and many people believe that the video warns of an impending bioterrorist attack on the US. Though this has not been proven, and many believe it to merely be a hoax, a marketing campaign, or a student film. Some of the hidden content found included the Spanish word for death, the phrase you have one year less, a Latin phrase meaning to attack or target men, then plain text reading you are already dead, as well as a picture of a skull and Morse code which when scrambled reads kill the president. The initial video was posted to YouTube and also contained threatening messages in binary code. The original poster, YouTube user AETBX, has since suggested that GadgetZZ.com were lying about how they came in possession of the video. Web sleuths were able to determine that it was filmed in an abandoned asylum outside of Poland between November of 2013 in October of 2015. Three months later, a man named Parker Warner Wright claimed he had created the video and posted a sequel called 11B31369. In a bid to confirm his identity, he challenged viewers to recreate the mask worn in the video, though he is only one of multiple people claiming ownership of the content. Shara Marie Jones vanished from her home in Oklahoma on September 21st, 2015 and hasn't been seen since. Shara was 20 years old at the time of her disappearance and living at home with her mother. She'd been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and had been managing her condition with medication. Shortly before her disappearance, there appeared to be some issues with the medication and Shara's behavior had been growing more erratic. Despite this, she managed to lead a relatively normal life and held down a job at a pharmacy. The night of Shara's disappearance, she became upset for some reason, though the cause for her upset remains unknown. It wasn't uncommon for her to leave the house for long walks at night. So when she left that evening, her mother didn't expect it would be long before she returned. Shara didn't take her car or her phone with her, so it seemed unlikely she had plans to stay away for a long period of time, or any plans at all. For two weeks, Shara's mother left her front door unlocked expecting Shara to return home after the episode. She grew concerned when she didn't show up for work and when she didn't pick up the medication that was scheduled to be collected a few days after she was last seen. After two weeks, Shara's family knew this wasn't like the other times she had disappeared and her mother contacted police. Police were able to look into Shara's bank records and discovered she'd used her bank card two times the night she had disappeared, but there had been no activity since. Her paycheck from the pharmacy remained untouched. Her social media also remained quiet and there were no leads for police to follow. 
Searches of the local area turned up nothing, and the case quickly went cold. Police claim the investigation is still active, but with no new leads, little progress has been made. It was 10 years ago this month that Madison Scott disappeared after a party in Canada. Madison was 20 years old at the time of the disappearance and had a busy social life typical of someone her age. It wasn't uncommon for her to set off for social events at the spur of the moment, and she didn't mind changing plans if there was something more interesting to do. However, she was also very close to her family, and she would always keep them up to date with her plans. A birthday party at Hogsback Lake was also something she decided to attend at the last minute. She attended with a small group of friends and was planning to camp out by the lake with one friend so they could enjoy the night and not have to worry about how they were getting home. Plans changed while they were at the party. It was supposed to be a small group of close friends, but the event was posted to Facebook and more people showed up than had been expected. A fight broke out and the friend Madison was supposed to be camping with was injured. The friend's boyfriend took her home. They invited Madison to come with them, but Madison wanted to stay and camp out, so they left her behind. The party continued for a few more hours. Stragglers who stayed until around 4 a.m. reported seeing Madison shortly before they left. She was alone in her tent and didn't appear to be acting unusual. The following morning, Madison's friend returned to the lake to pick her up. The tent was a mess and Madison's jewelry had been left outside on the ground. Madison was nowhere to be seen. Madison's family contacted police not long after. Everyone who attended the party was interviewed and while some were described as troublemakers, nobody could explain what had happened to the missing woman. Madison's friend sat through multiple lie detector tests and was eventually ruled out as a suspect. The area around the lake was searched and continues to be searched on a regular basis by investigators and members of the public, hoping to come across something that may have been missed in the years before. Madison's family continue to hope that as time passes, someone who knows what happened will finally come forward and explain the situation from that evening. Crystal Reisinger vanished sometime in July of 2016, but confusion over the exact timeline of events has made pinpointing when she disappeared difficult. With those who would have last been seen with her under suspicion as well, figuring out what happened to Crystal has been an impossible task for police so far. Crystal was a 29-year-old mother of one at the time of her disappearance. She'd had a difficult upbringing and spent her later teenage years living with her boyfriend's family and the family of her best friend. As an adult, she was very spiritual, with interests in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Native American belief systems. Her four-year-old daughter lived with the girl's father, Crystal's ex-boyfriend, but she still phoned every day to speak to her. It was when these calls stopped that Crystal's loved ones grew concerned. Crystal had moved to Colorado in 2014. She lived in a relatively small town with less than 150 residents, and Crystal had come there for a spiritual cleansing. One of those 150 people was a man referred to as Dreddy Brian, a man Crystal had been dating when she moved to the area but broke up with not long after. Brian introduced her to a man named Nathan and another man known as Catfish John. Crystal was dating Nathan at the time of her disappearance, and he's one of the last people to have seen her before she vanished. 
It was late June when she came to him, claiming to have been drugged and attacked at Catfish John's house. She was clearly terrified and Nathan urged her to contact police. Other sources claim it was her landlady who Crystal confided in, but said the attack happened at a drum circle ceremony. According to Nathan, he looked after her for a few weeks before she left on or around July 14th. This was also around the time Crystal stopped contacting her daughter. There were two more alleged sightings over the next few days. Some people claim to have seen Crystal at a full moon drum ceremony on July 18th, though this was never confirmed, while Catfish John told investigators Crystal had come to his house for his birthday around July 21st. They had smoked and drunk wine, but nothing had happened to her there and she left in good health. By the time Crystal was reported missing, almost two weeks had passed since the last confirmed sighting. Some have claimed Catfish John or Brian were involved in her disappearance though both deny having anything to do with the case. So far, there have been no arrests or any signs that could lead to finding Crystal. The disappearance of aspiring author Keith Reinard reads like the novel he was trying to write. Unfortunately, the story is yet to get a satisfying ending as the mystery remains unsolved more than 30 years later. Keith was a sports journalist by trade, writing for the Chicago Daily Herald. In 1988, he decided it was time to take a sabbatical from his job. A friend had recently moved to Silver Plume, a small town in Colorado that sat in the shadow of Pendleton Mountain and convinced Keith it was the perfect place for him to escape while he pursued his dream of writing a novel. His wife wasn't keen on the trip at first, but Keith eventually convinced her to let him travel to the town alone for a three-month trip. Keith arrived at Silver Plume in June of 1988. He rented a shop where he planned to reside and sell antiques. The shop had been empty since September of the year before, when the previous occupier disappeared under mysterious circumstances. It wasn't long after Keith arrived in Silver Plume that he learned about the previous shopkeeper. Tom Young was an Army Special Forces veteran and had sold books from the shop. In September of 1987, he took his dog Gus for a hike up the mountain and never returned. Keith was fascinated by the story, which was still unresolved when he moved to Silver Plume and decided to incorporate it into the novel that he was writing. Some sources claim his novel was entirely based upon Tom's disappearance, while others claim the character was based upon Keith himself. Whatever the case, Keith did a lot of investigation to try to add details to his story. A few months after Keith had arrived in town, hunters discovered the remains of Tom and his dog on the mountain. They had both suffered gunshot wounds and the weapon that was used against them was found with the bodies. Tom's death was ruled a suicide, though it was a conclusion many close to Tom disagreed with. The discovery didn't appear to unsettle Keith. On August 7th, 11 months to the day after Tom had disappeared, Keith set off on a solo hike up the same mountain. It was late in the day when he set off, something which concerned many of his friends. The hike was extremely difficult after dark and Keith had never reached the summit of the mountain, nor had he attempted to climb it by himself. Keith was undeterred and told them he would be back in a few hours. When he hadn't returned the following day, search parties set out to try to find the missing rider, but there was no sign of him. What happened remains unknown. Some claim Keith had attempted to end his own life on the mountain, though he had recently written to his old workplace 
to discuss what sports he would be covering when he returned. Others claim he ran away with the woman he met at a party the night before he vanished. Some believe Keith's disappearance was caused by the same person who took Tom Young's life, but so far, there's no evidence to back any theory and the reality remains a mystery. Ray Gricar vanished into thin air in April of 2005, leaving behind a successful law career, a fiancé and child, and a mangled laptop and hard drive. The circumstances of Ray's disappearance are deceptively mundane. It was only a few months before he was due to retire from his post as District Attorney of Center County, Pennsylvania, a role he had held for 30 years. The morning of his disappearance, he called his fiancée to tell her he was taking the day off of work and going for a short road trip. He traveled along the rural Route 192 and ended up in nearby Lewisburg, about an hour's drive away. Witnesses saw him strolling through a picturesque antiques mall and his car was later found in the parking lot nearby. It wasn't exactly an unusual outing for Ray, who was known to do this sort of thing at the spur of a moment. But when he didn't return home, his fiancée grew concerned and contacted police. Investigators went door to door in the search of the district attorney. His car was found the day after he disappeared, locked. Ray's keys, wallet, and laptop were missing, but his cell phone was found in the car. Police claimed there were no signs of foul play, but the car did reek of cigarette smoke and ash was found on the passenger side footwell. Ray was a non-smoker and didn't like other people smoking in his car. Who had left the ash there is one of the many unanswered questions concerning the case. Searches of the area produced nothing. The car was found parked near a river a scene of tragedy for Ray's family as his brother had taken his own life there some years before. Despite the official verdict, Ray had never believed his brother had taken his own life, as he didn't believe Roy would do that to his children. The history of the location prompted investigators to search the river, but there was no sign of Ray at the time. Three months later, however, the missing laptop turned up in the same river not too far away. The laptop was issued by the county and had been used for work. It was now mangled with the hard drive physically ejected. Two months passed and the hard drive was found, though it was unreadable. This was the last major piece of progress in the case. None of Ray's other belongings have ever been found. Many witnesses have come forward with sightings of him but none that police have been able to confirm. There are dozens of theories, with everything from a witness protection program to a disappearance with a secret lover being suggested. Many of the people Ray had prosecuted in his career had been put into the spotlight, but there's never been enough evidence to tie any one person to the disappearance. In the southernmost peninsula of Brooklyn, Maine, there lies an archaeological site known as the Goddard Site, which has been dated back to 1200 AD. The people who live there are believed to have been the ancestors of the modern Penobscot people, and the site itself was once a popular trading post for Native Americans in the area. A large number of artifacts found at the site are believed to have originated elsewhere, like pottery remnants that are believed to have come as far away as New Jersey and Nova Scotia and a Dorset Eskimo engraving tool. But it's not only objects from the American East Coast that were found at the Goddard site. In 1957, an amateur archaeologist found an old coin. Metal coins are very uncommon in pre-Columbian North America, so to find a coin among objects believed to be from 300 years before Columbus made his voyage should be surprising. However, the find wasn't paid much attention to at first. 
It was believed at first to have been an English penny from the 11th century that had been brought over by Maine colonists and accidentally left at the site, separate from the rest of the artifacts there. Why colonists would have brought along a 200-year-old coin into the New World and simply dropped it is unclear. It seemed the explanation didn't convince some experts, and in 1978, a coin expert from London confirmed this wasn't a British coin. In fact, it had originated from the Norse world. Further examination revealed it had likely been minted between 1065 and 1080, during the reign of King Olaf III of Norway. It's well known today that Viking explorers were the first Europeans to make settlements in North America, with Leif Erikson having made the journey from Greenland in 1001 AD. Norse travelers conquered and settled throughout much of Europe during the Viking Age, but they enjoyed much less success in North America. Only a handful of settlers ever tried to make homes in the modern Newfoundland and the settlements there lasted less than a decade. The Norse aren't believed to have traveled any further than their settlement in Newfoundland. So how this coin, minted decades after the last of the Norse left North America, found its way to a Native American trading post remains a mystery. There have been a number of suggestions. While they didn't stay in Canada, settlements in Greenland lasted much longer, and it's believed they may have traded with their Canadian neighbors. Given Dorset tools were found among the objects, it's not too much to think a coin, possibly worn as a pendant, could have been traded. However, no other Norse objects were found at the site. The other possibility is that the coin was a hoax and had been placed there by archaeologists. Experts say the coin is authentic, but there's no way of knowing for sure how it ended up there. In 1914, a man surveying his property in California came across a boulder with a strange design on it. It looked like something out of a children's activity book. A maze with a central box surrounded by lines that resembled pathways. The design was about 24 inches square, and bright white lines stood out against the dark brown of the rock. The detail and precision made the rancher think it wasn't something created by local kids, and he contacted the authorities. Archaeologists would later study the design and used artifacts from a nearby prehistoric village to determine the feature had to be at least 500 years old. It's impossible to accurately date such things, and some speculated that this artwork could have been created some 3,000 years ago. The meaning behind the maze is unknown. According to researchers, local Native American tribes had no explanation for the artwork. It didn't resemble anything that had been found up until that point. Usually, Native American carvings depicted animals or people, or local rivers and other landmarks. Since the maze stone was found, only around 50 have ever been found in addition to this one, all within 150 miles of each other. It seems this type of artwork wasn't something that was picked up by tribes outside of the local area. In the bottom corner was a symbol that would later be appropriated by hate groups, but at the time was known for its importance in East Asian religions, giving rise to speculation that this piece of art was created by Chinese fishermen that had gone off course and wound up in California. While there are other pieces of evidence indicating sailors from China accidentally wound up on the west coast of California in pre-Columbian times, they're rare and no archaeological evidence from the maize stone has been able to suggest that it had Chinese origins. The symbol is also relatively common in Native American artwork, though it usually appeared in pottery or textiles. For one tribe, the symbol represented their wanderings when they lived as a nomadic people. For others, it represented a canoe used by a legendary hero and was a symbol used in healing rituals. Even though the Native American groups researchers spoke to had no knowledge of the meeting behind the maze, it seems more likely their ancestors created it than lost fishermen from China. But what it was created for will never be known. Throughout human history, the graves of animals have been found alongside human settlements. Given the importance of the likes of dogs, horses, and other pets to civilizations, both ancient and modern, it's not usually too surprising when archaeologists dig up such remains. However, one site on an island in the English Channel held a much more unusual grave. In 2017, 
Archaeologists were excavating a site on Chapelle d'Amhieu, an islet just off the coast of Guernsey. In the 14th and 15th centuries, the islet served as a religious retreat for monks and archaeologists who had started the dig in hopes of uncovering remains of a building that had once stood there. Not only did they find the building which was larger than expected, they found a number of clean-cut plots that appeared to be graves. Images from the surface indicated there was something in one of the graves, but the shape was unusual and the team decided to dig it up. They were surprised to find not a human skeleton, but the triangular skull of a porpoise. The porpoise had been carefully buried in the grave plot with no explanation as to why. Archaeologists working on the site described it as the most baffling find of their career. It was only made even more confusing when the ancient grave of a handless man was found nearby a few months later. It was assumed the handless man was either a monk who had died on the islet or a sailor who had drowned at sea. He had been buried in a roughly east to west orientation, indicating he had been given a Christian burial. The buttons found with the remains suggested he had been clothed at the time. The lack of hands was naturally the most intriguing aspect of the body. It was possible they had been amputated for medical reasons, but archaeologists remarked his feet were in good condition and showed no signs of any illness. In 2020, it emerged the body was not that of a monk who had died in the 15th century. An analysis of the remains, including the buttons, indicated the person may have been a Royal Navy sailor who died around 1760. The proximity to the porpoise was entirely a coincidence, and the people who had buried him likely didn't know about the marine animal that was below their feet. As for the porpoise, experts still don't have an agreed-upon explanation for the remains. The animal had been eaten in medieval times, but usually, the remains would have been disposed of in the sea. One explanation is that it had been buried in a brine to preserve it, but the monks simply forgot it was there. Alternatively, some suggested that the animal had religious importance that has since been lost to time. The Starving of Saqqara is a possibly ancient sculpture made all the more mysterious due to the fact it wasn't discovered by archaeologists but was brought to the attention of experts by antique collectors. Information about where it came from comes only from speculation and whether it's authentic or a modern fake is still up for debate. The statue supposedly originated in ancient Egypt around the capital of Memphis, specifically the vast burial ground just outside the city known as Saqqara. It's roughly 26 inches tall, made from limestone, and depicts two figures sat facing one another. Their heads are elongated, their limbs are thin, and one could possibly be holding a baby. The base of the statue appears to be an ancient script from a language yet to be deciphered. The statue is unlike anything else uncovered in Egypt. There are, however, reliefs found around the pyramid of a pharaoh from the 24th century BC, featuring figures that somewhat resemble the people in the statue. The relief is believed to depict starving people trying to survive a time of famine, hence the name given to the statue. The known history of the statue begins in the mid-20th century. It was acquired by a man and his wife, a French couple who collected antiques from ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome at a time when the sale of such pieces was strictly forbidden. In the 1950s, the couple migrated to Canada, taking a number of pieces with them, including the starving of Saqqara. Despite not being able to say specifically where it came from, the statue was appraised as authentic and there were other pieces that traveled with it. For a while, it was housed in their private museum before being handed over to a university in the 1990s. Since then, the university has tried to discover as much about the statue as possible. Experts still haven't come to a consensus about whether or not it's real. It's possible this was a pre-dynastic work of art, meaning it was created before ancient Egypt as we imagine it existed. If so, there's no way it could be connected to the reliefs it resembles. Others have suggested it may have been designed to resemble a ruler of ancient Egypt. If it is a modern fake, the creator managed to trick someone who dealt with ancient works of art and managed to convince them that something that looks nothing like anything else he had come across was the real deal. 
People who believe crop circles are produced by visiting aliens claim the designs represent everything from maps of the universe to a form of communication. While the markings on the Kakno stone definitely have a much more earthly origin, the speculation about the meanings of the designs are remarkably similar. The Kakno stone is one of the best examples of cup and ring carvings, an ancient form of artwork that was once common across northern Europe. The stone is a 42 by 26 foot slab of rock uncovered in Scotland by a reverend in 1887. For almost a century, it was something of a tourist attraction as scientists and scholars tried to explain what the markings meant. The designs are believed to have been created more than 5,000 years ago. There are more than 90 designs varying in size and detail. Most of the designs are a similar pattern of rings within rings, but there's also a cross within an oval and two pairs of carved footprints, though each foot has only four toes. Unfortunately, over the years, modern Scots added to the work of their ancient ancestors with graffiti of their own. Even professional researchers in the early 20th century damaged the rock by highlighting the designs with white paint. In 1964, the University of Glasgow made the decision to rebury the rock to try to preserve it. For about 50 years, it remained undisturbed with undergrowth growing on top of it. A few years ago, the university briefly unearthed the Cockno Stone again so it could be scanned and a model could be created for further study. Like most work from that time, the meaning behind the artwork has been lost to time. Some have speculated it was a map of settlements in the area or a map of the stars. It could be a form of writing or it could have religious or spiritual meaning. The patterns may also simply be graffiti with no further meaning making its protection from further graffiti in the modern day ironic. On March 23, 2021, at about 12.39 in the morning, 19-year-old Richard Akorogaya emerges from a taxi dressed in all black with a matching bag. Earlier that evening, he'd been taking a bus and then a taxi 20 miles from his home in West London to Loughton in Essex. He's caught on camera walking in the direction of Epping Forest. Two days later, Richard's mother reports her son missing. Video evidence emerges after a witness reported seeing him board a southbound bus to Ladbrook Grove. Detectives go door to door and learn that he took a taxi to Smart's Lane that night. They found him on street cameras and after knocking on more doors, revealing no leads, they expanded their search into the forest itself. After two weeks, his remains were discovered in the far back in the swamplet missing on his person were his shoes, his phone, and a black bag. His mother was flabbergasted when detectives suspected no foul play. That would mean her son voluntarily walked an hour and 30 minutes with no flashlight in darkness for an unknown reason detectives cannot explain. This was extremely out of character for him, she told press. He was a student at Oxford Brooks University who'd been playing it safe all year by staying home except for doctor visits due to a condition called sickle cell anemia. There's no way he would go anywhere, let alone across the city at night, unless he was meeting someone and it was very important. Some say he vanished into the woods to end it all and escape from the stress. His mother admits that he was struggling to cope with student life, but if that were the case, then why would he take off his shoes and get rid of his phone? And what was in the black bag? Did he abandon these items or were they taken by someone? An autopsy revealed no outward physical damage to his body, and at the time of this writing, the unsolved case has revealed no answers. Answers that his mother desperately needs to hear. It was September 24th, 2016, at about 1.20 a.m. Corey McKeague is caught on camera wandering the streets of Barry St. Edmunds. The 23-year-old Suffolk resident had just been asked to leave the Flex nightclub after saying I love you to the manager. He goes to a favorite local hangout called Pizza Mamma Mia, where he ordered two burgers, a kebab, some chips, and then fell asleep in the doorway of a hardware store called Hughes for one hour. By the morning, he was on a missing persons list. By now, he was caught on camera again at 3.25 a.m. and he was seen looking left and right as though he were disoriented and unsure where to go next. He vanished out of sight and no one has seen him since. The area he was heading into was a garbage collection site known as the Horseshoe. This is a rather seedy part of town where people are often up to no good. 
There's cameras facing every entrance, so if he went this way, he should have been filmed coming back out at some point, but he never was. Police theorize that he climbed into one of the many industrial-sized garbage bins in the horseshoe, something he had apparently been known to do on one occasion in the past. But this time, according to them, he was picked up by a garbage truck and thrown into the trash compactor. They determined this when the coordinates of his cell phone matched the collection route of a garbage truck in the area. All modern garbage bins have weight sensors. City data shows the garbage truck in question was indeed carrying an oversized load of approximately 250 pounds one hour after McKee was last seen, heading in the same direction of the two beds. Normally, they don't weigh more than about 60 pounds on any given day. But as his mother pointed out, none of this proves that he climbed in there voluntarily. He could have been put there by someone else. And in fact, shortly after getting takeout food, her missing son had passed by two mysterious strangers. They've been interviewed and ruled out by police, but rumors run wild. Some people claim the missing man is being lured by someone out of sight, perhaps by the two people he passed by earlier. Subscribers to this theory claim that he seems timid and trying to get away from people, but that's just an internet rumor. What McKeague's mom has to say is quite different. One day, she came across a Facebook post from a local group of taxi drivers discussing her son and his disappearance. In the post, many other taxi drivers recognized him walking around the area in the past. One of them could have picked him up that night, and if so, could that be why he was not caught on camera leaving the horseshoe? Maybe his mother is clinging too hard to her last shreds of hope. Or maybe she's right about there being a small chance that he could have been left in a taxi that night instead of a bed. Perhaps he threw his cell phone away and hailed a cab. They never did find McKeague despite a million dollar recovery mission spanning two different landfills. So even though this missing persons case is officially solved, stranger things have happened. 20-year-old San Antonio resident Delaney Chárez used to take James, her one-year-old son, to visit her sister Marisol Gomez quite often. Then one day they stopped. Well, Chárez didn't stop coming over, but James did. It was as though he had vanished. Months passed and whenever Gomez asked about where her nephew was, she never got a definite answer. Finally, she confessed that she'd given him up for adoption to a family friend. Exactly who this family friend was, she refused to say. Months passed, and in late February of 2021, Gomez couldn't take any more grief and called the police about her sister. Authorities were able to locate this missing CCTV video of Chárez walking into a store with James in the stroller. It was the last time he's been caught on camera to date. Days later, the chilling footage shows her staring out the window of a bus on February 24th, and James is nowhere in sight. Police have used this video in conjunction with Gomez's testimony to show that Chárez was not in proper care of her child. Since you're not legally allowed to simply give your child away to a family friend without going through the proper adoption paperwork, they searched her home to find out where the child could be. There, they found a number of disturbing items, including a blanket stained red as if it had been wrapped around something small like a child. In March of 2021, Chárez was taken into custody where she gave conflicting reports and subsequently was charged in relation to her alleged mistreatment and disappearance of James. The poor young boy has yet to be found alive or otherwise, and his aunt now fears her worst suspicions have been confirmed. That something terrible happened and that he won't be coming back. The unsolved missing persons case is still underway though. The Grand Canyon is separated into three different destinations. The North Rim has the highest altitude, which makes it a little too chilly for most visitors to enjoy. The West Rim has a glass walkway that is one of the biggest tourist attractions in the area. And then you have the South Rim, famous for multiple missing persons cases, all mysteriously linked despite years of separation. On July 13th, 2009 at 6 a.m., a blue vehicle suddenly turns left and accelerates over grass. Bleary-eyed vacationers watch in horror as 57-year-old Girge Hiriak disappears behind the Thunderbird Lodge and then does something unspeakably terrifying. With a sharp right turn, Girge promptly vanishes over the South Rim. Rescuers descend the 600-foot drop to identify the remains of the Romanian-born male. Forensic investigators later determined that this was an intentional and deliberate act, not a car malfunction. Strangest of all, he's the latest addition in a frightening trend spanning decades. 
On November 22, 1993, 19-year-old California resident Michael Balboa Swinger of Bakersfield County took the same terrifying plunge. Investigators discovered a mysterious note left behind, the contents of which have never been made public. One week prior, a woman named Patricia Alfonso attempted to drive off in her Chevy over the South Rim as well, but it got stuck on a rock and she got out and jumped. None of them knew each other and yet they may have been inspired to do so by a common link. The 1991 release of a popular Hollywood film, Thelma and Louise, directed by Ridley Scott of Alien fame. In this movie, actresses Greena Davis and Susan Sarandon drove off the Grand Canyon in a scene that was very romanticized and perhaps a little too inspiring for some. While it's unclear if Gheorghe was inspired by the movie this many years later, some say his blue car may be a deliberate choice to match the vehicle from the film Thelma and Louise. One can only wonder. Regardless, it's scary to think that a single work of art could elicit the demise of so many in such a bizarre way. In early April of 2021, caretakers of a 72-year-old woman with memory problems were shocked to find all of her belongings in their Daytona Beach Motel 6 room. She, however, was missing. A police helicopter was dispatched, but police search efforts were hampered by the scheduled flights of a nearby airport. Seven hours later, the unnamed missing person was found alive in a swampy area of the Tomoka River, a mere half mile away. Her hands were over her eyes, and she seemed very confused and distressed from the bright sun and the helicopter above. But thankfully, she was still breathing. She appears to have tumbled into the shallow water where she remained put. This was fortunate because it seems to have been what kept her in place long enough to be discovered. She was taken to the hospital as a precaution, and she's expected to be okay. Unfortunately, these sorts of missing persons cases occur quite often, and not all cases end so well. Just 650 miles west and five months earlier, a Louisiana woman with memory problems named Anna Mae Chauvin disappeared in a town called Destrehead. She took a taxi from the local mall to her house and got lost in her own neighborhood, wandering around in the cold weather for hours. She was eventually found in a swampy drainage canal by a rescue helicopter, much like the other woman from Daytona. When the helicopter pilot looked down, they didn't see a frail old woman covering her eyes in fear, but rather someone who was sadly not moving at all. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more videos, but I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys next time.